this is lecture, introductory lecture to the endocrine system. Introductory lecture to the endocrine system for third year students. Uh, my information about the lecture. Let's begin. The endocrine system. So what is the endocrine system? The endocrine system is a type of chemical messenger system. It consists of hormones which are a group of uh, glands of mm -hmm. organisms that secrete those hormones directly into the circulatory system to regulate the function of usually certain distant target organs. The feedback loops which moderate hormone release so that the homeostasis is maintained. That defines the endocrine system. You can see examples of various endocrine organs. We'll go through them one by one. Terminology. Endocrinology. What is endocrinology? Endocrinology is a branch of biology and medicine dealing with the endocrine system, its diseases, and specific secretions, which are known as hormones. The endocrine gland. A gland that secretes a substance, hormone, into the bloodstream. The endocrine glands are glands of internal secretion. They include the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, pineal gland, thyroid, parathyroid, the heart, which is responsible for making the actual natriuretic peptides, the stomach and intestine, islets of Bandingar in the pancreas, the adrenal gland, the kidneys, which make renin, erythropoietin, calcitriol, the fat cells, which make leptin, the testes, the ovary, follicles, Estrogen, corpus luteinum in the ovary make up the main endocrine gland of the skin. Hormone. What is a hormone? This concept was a bit difficult to uh, denote. Took some time to find an appropriate definition. Hormone is defined as a biologically active substance with a well-defined period of action and a half-life. It's produced by special secretory endocrine cells and it's typically secreted into biological fluids, which is usually blood, and has a specific target, which is usually typical, resulting in a specific biological Hormones are classified by chemical structure, giving us the following variations of hormones. Amino acid derivatives, small molecule structure related to individual amino acids, and we have several types. One is derivatives of tyrosine, amino acid, thyroid hormone, tyrosine is an example of a tyrosine derivative. Other tyrosine derivatives are catecholamine epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Different type of amino acid derivative is the derivative of tryptophan, the hormone melatonin. These are all small molecules, amino acids. And we have some bigger hormones. These are known as peptide hormones which consists of amino acid chains. We have groups of glycoproteins. Glycoproteins include hormones in the pituitary gland, such as the thyroid stimulating hormone TSH, luteinizing hormone LH, follicular stimulating hormone FSH, kidney erythropoietin, short polypeptide and small protein is another group where we have hormones that consist of less than 200 amino acids. This includes the hormones of the hypothalamus, antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, 
regulatory hormones, pituitary glands, adrenocorticotropic hormones, growth hormones, somatotropin, melan melan uh, melatonin stimulating hormone, and prolactin. In the heart, atrial natriuretic peptides and brain natriuretic peptides are produced. In the digestive tract, we also have various uh, special small molecules, less than 200 amino acid peptides, so GIT peptides. In the pancreas, we have insulin and glucagon. Parathyroid gland gives us the para hormone. T cells of the thyroid gland produce calcitonin. Adipose tissue produces lipin. So finally, we have lipid derivatives. In lipid derivatives, we also have two main groups. These are a cousinoids, lipid derivatives of paraffin, uh, paraffinic acid. These include limb system hormones such as leukotriene, prostaglandin, thromboxane, prostacycline. An example is shown with prostaglandin E. And lipid derivatives often include steroid hormones. These are structurally similar to <coughs> cholesterol, which is the common progenitor of all steroid hormones. And we have gonads producing androgen, estrogen, progesterone, and the suprarenal cortex producing mineralocorticoids, aldosterone, glucocorticoids, cortisol, various androgens, and the kidneys producing calcitriol. As a rule, protein based hormones act on the cell surface receptors, and steroid based hormones act on intracellular nuclear proteins. This complicated chart is perhaps one of the most complicated things in endocrinology, the steroidogenesis, the creation of steroid hormones. We have the common precursor cholesterol molecule going into steroidogenesis and with the help of various enzymes is converted into its final products which are aldosterone, mineralocorticoids, Cortisol, glucocorticoid. And of course, some of these go into androgen steroidogenesis, producing estrone, estradiol, estriol, testosterone, and various kinds of um, products. These enzymes are important, and of course, these enzymes may be deficient, mutated broken, leading to chronic congenital epinephral insufficiency, a group of diseases, usually involving deficiencies of such enzymes 21 hydroxylase, but could have deficiency of the uh, beta enzymes and 11 <coughs> beta enzymes. In which case, the progenitors of steroids do not go into the production of aldosterone and cortisol and instead go into the production of androgen. Why does this happen? Because of what we're going to talk about later, regulation of hormonal secretions. When these hormones are not produced, they act on the hypothalamus system, which acts on the hypothesis system, which basically results in producing of large quantities of adrenocorticotropic hormone which stimulates conversion of cholesterol in the epinephral cortex into aldosterone and cortisol. But because of the absence of enzymes of 21 hydroxylase, the final products are stimulated as 17 hydroxyprogesterone and switch into the androgen synthesis cycle, resulting in huge amounts of epinephrenal testosterone leading to conditions of premature sexual development for boys and virilization adrenogenital syndrome for girls. Okay, here are the glands and the hormones they produce. 
quickly go through them and try to remember as much as possible. Hypothalamus produces anti-diuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, mm -hmm. oxytocin, and regulatory hormone. Regulatory hormones are the liberins and statins. So much statins, so much liberin, so much liberin, etc. More hormones. Now, hypothalamus produces oxytocin and vasopressin, but it does not secrete them. These hormones travel to the pituitary gland or the hypothesis to the posterior lobe, the neural hypothesis, where they accumulate, and then this gland secretes oxytocin and vasopressin into the bloodstream. The anterior lobe, the adenal hypothesis, synthesizes its own hormones. These are the stimulating hormones, adrenocorticotropic hormones, uh, thyrostimulating hormones, human growth hormones, two types of gonad stimulating hormones, which are FSH and LH. Melanin, mel melanin, uh, melatonin stimulating hormone, prolactin. The pineal gland, stimulated by the pituitary arterial lobe, produces melatonin. Parathyroid gland produces the parat hormone. Thyroid gland produces tyroxin, triodurinine, and calcitonin. Thymus produces thymosin, kidney drain, erythropoietin, calcitriol. The heart produces the peptides. The adipose tissue produces leptin, resistin. Digestive tract produces various kinds of uh, gastroactive peptides, pancreas, insulin, and glucagon. And uh, I mentioned here, but it also produces some of the of course. Uh, gonads produce the male one endocrine testosterone, and ovaries estrogen progesterone. Adrenal gland produces the cortex of cortisol and corticosterone, aldosterone, androgens, and another one epinephrine and norepinephrine. Hormone release control. So of course something has to regulate how the hormones are secreted and there are three mechanisms by which this regulation occurs. We have number one, humoral stimulation. Humoral stimulation works by having certain, uh, let's say, uh, electrolytes, for instance, in the blood at certain levels. They directly affect the glands that cause the secretion. As for example, the parathyroid gland, where the concentration of calcium becomes low, the parathyroid gland begins to secrete the parathyroid hormone, which causes washing away of calcium from bones and increase of calcium in the blood. <coughs> the increase of calcium therefore stops the secretion of the parathyroid hormone. So it's maintained by the level of calcium in the blood itself. <coughs> by the same way, uh, for the most part, aldosterone is also secreted in a humoral regulation process, although it does have some uh, regulation from the hypothetical hypothalamic system as well. Neural stimulus. Neural stimulation. In which case, we have the nervous system directly influencing the secretion of hormones, direct nervous system stimulation. In this case, we have three ganglionic sympathetic fibers stimulate adrenal middle cell. So the sympathetic nervous system activates, the tonus of the sympathetic nervous system increases, this causes adrenal gland secretion. Quick stress response. Capitalines are secreted epinephrine or epinephrine into the blood. And hormonal stimulation, where one hormonal stimulates the secretion of another hormone. <laughs> Via the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland system. Okay, let's review the hormones. So what important hormones and their functions we have? Hormones of the thyroid. 
Pyrozone basically releases two hormones. Curiosity, D3, and Turexin. Basically. We say basically because, of course, there's also a third hormone, stereocalcitonin, which is also secreted. But the, the, the main hormones of Pyrozone are, of course, the D3, D4. They control the metabolism of the body. In small children, and children in general, these hormones regulate brain development, physical development, body mass of children, energy levels of children, internal body temperature, skin trophy, and skin appendages trophy. Insulin. This is a hormone secreted by the pancreas. It allows the body to use glucose or sugar from carbohydrates in the food for energy or to store glucose for future use. Basically, it maintains normal blood sugar levels to prevent hyper hypoglycemia. Its basic function is to increase the uptake of glucose by cells. Basically by activating glucose called transporter proteins. Vasopressin. Antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Hormone made by the hypothalamus in the brain and stored in the posterior pituitary gland. Tells your kidneys how much water to conserve. It regulates water. So it constantly regulates the balance of the amount of water in your blood. It, it, it regulates your volume of circulation, it regulates basically your hematocrit. Insufficient hormone causes dehydration. Too much hormone causes water intoxication. Osmotic sensors in the hypothalamus react to the concentration of sodium, potassium, chloride, carbon dioxide. Although they, uh, that there is a humoral regulation of this hormone secretion by sodium, potassium, chloride, it does not actually regulate the amount of ions in the blood. It only regulates water balance. So the only way it regulates the concentration of salt is by adding or removing water, not by influencing the ions themselves. Important hormones and their functions. Continue. Estrogen, female sex hormone, released by the ovary, responsible for the reproduction, menstruation, menopause. Excess of estrogen in female body increases the risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, depression, moodiness, etc. Low estrogen levels lead to acne, skin lesion, thinning skin, hair loss, etc. So too much, bad, too little, bad, like most hormones, like most hormones. Hormones require a specific concentration. Whatever is not exact is bad. Progesterone, hormones produced by the ovaries, the placenta when a woman is pregnant, and the adrenal gland, as far as the story is that. Stimulates and regulates various functions. It plays an important role in maintaining pregnancy, helps the body to prepare for conception, for pregnancy, and regulates the monthly cycle. When pregnancy does not occur, progesterone levels drop, and the menstrual cycle occurs. So therefore, it plays a role in sexual desire. The woman is ready for getting pregnant. She's more sexually active, so higher level sexual Pregnancy does not occur, progesterone levels drop. This influences the woman's behavior. Because obviously she's no longer ready to get pregnant. Prolactin. <coughs> it's released by the pituitary gland after childbirth for lactation, which enables females to breastfeed. Levels of prolactin hormone rise during pregnancy and it plays an important role in fertility. 
by inhibiting the follicular stimulating hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone. Besides the um, functions of this hormone for females, uh, it also functions for everybody as a stress dependent hormone, which levels typically increase during stress. Let's look at the male counterpart, and we have testosterone, another steroid hormone. Not just any steroid hormone, but testosterone is an anabolic steroid. So it helps in building muscle. In males, it plays an important role in the development of male reproductive tissue, development of testes and prostate, also promotes secondary sexual characteristics like increasing the mass of muscles and bones, growth of body hair, etc. If testosterone is secreted insufficient in men, it may lead to abnormalities including frailty of bones and bone loss. So for the most part, what does testosterone do? It creates more muscle tissue, more strength, and increases bone density, makes your bones stronger. most part this implies that usually after menopause women have a problem with osteoporosis and unless men have problems with their testosterone levels, they usually don't. Again, if a male does, then testosterone levels should be checked. There's a uh, little caricature of the benefits of optimal testosterone. As you can see, all the benefits that you have and all the problems that you have when you are lacking testosterone. So testosterone is good for men at optimal levels always. Remember that too much of any hormone is just as bad as too little. Mm -hmm. Levels are suboptimal, of course, they should be increased, but the levels are optimal. Taking too much will cause problems. This is an anabolic steroid and it can cause problems. Continuing on, serotonin, the fun one, the mood boosting uh, hormone, right? nature's feel good chemical, associated with learning, good memory, it regulates sleep, digestion, almost the digestion is regulated when you sleep. Mm -hmm. If you don't get enough sleep, your digestion gets under regulates mood, some muscular functions, and due to the imbalance of serotonin in the body, brain does not produce enough of the hormone to regulate mood or stress. So th there is no compensation. If you're overly stressed, your body does not produce more serotonin. It only produces an optimal level, and that's it. So if you're chronically stressed, you will always lack serotonin any kind of chemicals are taken that will stimulate the production of serotonin, which will of course get exhausted and with the absence of these chemicals, the serotonin levels will permanently remain as low as possible. Hence, producing addiction and withdrawal. After withdrawal, the levels of serotonin may never stabilize. Low levels of serotonin cause depression, migraine, weight gain, and <coughs> cravings of carbohydrates. Excess levels of serotonin in the body cause agitation, uh, state of confusion, sedation, etc. Adrenaline, epinephrine. The hormone secreted by the medulla of the adrenal gland, as well as some of the central nervous system neurons technically considered also a type of neurotransmitter. It is also known as an emergency hormone because it initiates the quick reaction which makes the individual uh, think and respond more quickly <coughs> in stressful situations. So this is a quick stress adaptation. This is the system of quick stress adaptation. Increases the metabolic rate, dilatation of blood vessels, dilatation of bronchs, 
um, especially the blood vessels in the heart and brain. But as far as blood vessels and peripheral tissues, then more likely it's going to cause some friction. Right? But heart and brain, it's the opposite effect. Because the dilatation increases the perfusion of these important organs. During stressful situation, adrenaline quickly releases into the blood, sends impulses to organs to create specific responses. That was the fast stress response. The next two hormone, well, the next hormone is the slow stress response. If the hormone, if one wants the fast adaptation, fast stress response, fast reactive existence, slow adaptation, more permanent adaptation to any stress whether it's physical, psychological, or biological, like infection. Main role is to control the deep stress, to help the body adapt. In danger, it increases the heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate. Stressful times, um, body secretes cortisol to cope up with these situations. Cortisol is also one of those hormones that is known as hormones that inhibit insulin. Walk it. They have counter insular action. So they stimulate the increase of glucose in the blood. High level of cortisol consistently causes ulcers because it also inhibits uh, cyclosagenase and causes hypersecretion in GIT. So it can increase pH in your stomach acid, gastric acid, and thus leads to ulceration. Uh, high blood pressure, anxiety, high levels of cortisol. I'm uh, sorry, high levels of cholesterol. Similarly, low level of cortisol in the body causes chronic fatigue syndrome. One of the fir very first symptoms of deficiency of cortisol is muscular weakness. Aldosterone. Steroid hormone secreted by the adrenal gland. Biological action is to increase the retention of sodium and water and to increase the excretion of potassium by the kidneys, thus resulting uh, regulating the salt water balance. So while vasopressin only controls the levels of water, and the aldosterone controls the levels of sodium and potassium. By influencing kidney absorption, reabsorption, of course, I if you retain sodium, then water will also be retained because of osmotic gradients. The water will follow the sodium in the kidney. Somatotropin, also known as the human growth hormone, or the growth hormone, basically a protein hormone, again less than 100 than 200 amino acids synthesized and secreted by cells called somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland. It stimulates growth, all growth, uh, cell reproduction, cell regeneration, boost metabolism. When say old growth, we're actually implying the following. Linear growth of bone, height, that's number one. Number two, muscle, it stimulates growth of muscle. And growth of internal organs. So which internal organ will be affected the most? The one that's mostly muscle, that's the heart. Thus, this hormone is extremely important in human growth and development. Okay, principal endocrine axis. So, endocrine regulation um, is a somewhat complex process, but it works in certain specific ways. Uh, these uh, principal that regulatory pathways are the called the endocrine axis. Here we have representation of various endocrine axes and you can see at which level what is happening. This is the hypothalamic region of the regulation, the hormones that are there, the pituitary region, the hormones that are there, glands 
there's the final glands, the target glands of secretion of hormones that are there, targeted hormones from the glands and the function. You can see what's happening, and in more detail we'll look at the axis. Regulation of an endocrine axis. How, how does that work? So, we have feedback control, both negative and positive, and that's the fundamental feature of an endocrine system. So the levels of the final product determine the level of stimulation. Regulation by negative feedback and direct control is shown here on this particular axis. Along with the equilibrium between active circulating free hormones and bound or metabolized hormones. Each of the major hypothalamus pituitary hormone axis is governed by negative feedback. So the more hormone is produced by the final primary endocrine organ, the more inhibition this uh, leads to in the tertiary hypothalamic system and the less amount of releasing hormones, releasing factors of vibrins are secreted as a result. And thus, these hormones are maintained at an optimal level. A certain relatively narrow uh, corridor of possible value. Too much is bad, too little is bad. Regulation of endocrine axis. You see me, here's a few more examples of regulation of endocrine axes, how they work. Uh, feedback regulation also occurs for endocrine systems that do not involve the pituitary gland. For example, glucose in inhibition of insulin secretion works in the same principle. You don't have enough glucose, so insulin stops secretion. You have more glucose, insulin secretes more. So we can have uh, regulation without the uh, hypothalamic system, but hypothalamic system axes are the ones that are very common uh, way of regulating hormone secretion. There's a lot of them. Okay, now we're getting into. Uh, pathology, we're getting into semiotics. And here we see classification of endocrine disorders based on what's going on. Now, endocrine organs are functional organs, right? They always function. And the main way you can have disorders is if the function is disrupted for whatever reason. The function is not disrupted, then you, know, you, you don't really have too much of an endocrine disorder. So, what kind of function disruptions do we have? Number one, hormone excess. And in this case, we can either have a primary gland overproduction, the gland itself produces too much hormone. Example would be period of Or secondary to excess trophic substance, or tertiary releasing substance. Secondary implies the centralized release of tropic hormones, TFH for example, right, or tertiary release of releasing factor or liberating tertiary problem. Both of these secondary and tertiary can be referred to as central problems. Central problems. Hormone deficiency works the same way but in reverse we have primary gland failure, like primary congenital hypothyroidism. Aplasia, hypoplasia, ectasia of the thyroid that's not secreted. Or more secondary to deficit trophic substance or tertiary releasing substance deficiency. For example, we can have uh, pan hypopituitarism, deficiency of at least three or more trophic hormones, trophic hormones from the pituitary gland. So we have deficiency of TSH, for instance. <coughs> deficiency of adrenocorticotropic hormone and somatotropin. And as a result, uh, this 
child manifests deficiency of syrup skin. <coughs> but not because the primary gland isn't working, but because the trophic hormones are not being secreted, or we can have tertiary releasing substance problems having to do with liberin, as for example of, for instance, the Kahneman syndrome, where gonadoliberin, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, is incapable from traveling from the hypothalamus to the hypothesis because of genetically inherited defects of certain neurons, including these ones. And so there is no stimulation of the pituitary gland, and thus no secretion of the trophic hormone, and thus leads to a condition that can be called a hypogonadotropic hypogonadotropic. Hormone hypersensitivity. This can result from either failure of inactivation of hormones. Hormones have a set life cycle, half-life, where they exist from nanoseconds to hours uh, that they exist. And uh, one of the ways that this half-life works is that another substance can inactivate the hormone. Well, what stops what? If this doesn't happen, hormone continues to circulate way longer than it's supposed to, and we can have hormonal <coughs> hypersensitivity. Target organ overactivity or hypersensitivity. Too many receptors or um, hyper secretion of post-receptoral signaling pathway, um, various chemicals. Hormonal resistance, failure of activation of hormones, <coughs> Again, some hormones need to be activated. Well, for example, uh, T3 needs to transform into T4 mm -hmm. in order to be active. Well, what happens if something breaks down along those lines? You have lots of T3, but you don't have T4. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility that can happen. Or target organ resistance, lack of receptors or defective receptors. So we have a mutation, receptors, <coughs> uh, for instance, to a... Um, Somatotropin are defective. Right. Or this could be uh, resistance further down the line. Somatotropin stimulates the production of somatidine, which are insulin like growth factor 1 and insulin like growth factor binding protein 3, and we can have defect in receptors to them. That happens, we have no treatment. Receptoral problems or peripheral hormonal problems doesn't work. Finally, we can have non-functioning tumors. Another possibility of what can happen. Non-functioning tumors. So we have a tumor in the endocrine gland, but it doesn't secrete anything. Okay. Those, that, that was the basic classification of what can happen in the endocrine system. Now we're going to go with non-specific presentations, so non-specific semiotics. What are <coughs> the various general symptoms? independently of what exact endocrine pathology. Yeah, well, what are some very common general symptoms that are common to multiple endocrine pathologies? Here they are. Lethargy and depression, typical for hypothyroidism, diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, etc. Weight gain, hypothyroidism, Cushing. Cushing is what? Hyper Hypercorticism. Hypercorticism. Weight loss. Serotoxicosis. Adrenal insufficiency. So, epinephral failure. Right. Um, diabetes militant. Especially in children. We're talking about diabetes militant type 1, where weight loss is the symptom of diabetes, not type 2, where weight gain is the cause of diabetes. It's two completely different things. Polyuria and polydipsia, main symptoms of diabetes, both militants and insipidus. Diabetes insipidus, in case you're wondering, that's a deficiency in vasopressin. 
hyperparathyroidism and Cohen syndrome, which is hypokalemia. Heat intolerance is your receptacle to menopause. Palpitations, serotoxicosis, theochromatitoma. Theochromatitoma is a tumor that produces catecholamine. Mm -hmm. And so it's an uh, epinephal tumor. Headaches, acromegaly, mm -hmm. pituitary tumor, theochromatitoma. Now, why is there a separation between acromegaly and pituitary tumor? Um, in terms of headaches, what is acromegaly? Uh, acromegaly is the second part of gigantism, which basically is a pituitary tumor. Mm -hmm. But you can have pituitary tumor from eosinophilic cells, which produce hematotropin, <laughs> or you can have a pituitary tumor of other cells. For instance, cells that produce prolactin. Mm -hmm. You can have different ones. You can have somatotropinoma, um, uh, somato and we can have prolactinoma different tumors. One causes acromegaly, the other one doesn't. But both cause headaches, of course, and possibly different problems because of hiatus um, opticus being local, uh, localized close to the pituitary gland, and when the tumor grows, it's present on the hiatus vision problems are also uh, something that's not listed here, but it comes from both acromegaly and pituitary. Muscular weakness. Uh, Tyroid toxicosis, Cushing syndrome, um, hyperparathyroidism, Cohn syndrome, hypogonadism. Um, I suppose you should also mention uh, epinephal insufficiency as well, that will also lead to muscular weakness. And coarsening of features, uh, that's hypothyroidism, the coarsening features due to mixed edema, and acromegaly due to the growth of cartilage on the face. Specific. Now with specifics. So what can we have? If we have problems with glucose homeostasis, what pathologies do we have and what are the semiotics of these pathologies? As an example of the main disease of glucose homeostasis disruption is diabetes mellitus. What are the symptoms of diabetes mellitus? We can have them from the central nervous system as polydipsia, mm -hmm. polyphonia, mm -hmm. in, in, um, in type 1 diabetes, lethargy, mm -hmm. super sopor coma, mm -hmm. especially in small children as they like to go into ketoacidosis and ketoacidosis coma from the very first days of manifestation, or the on age, so it could be days or weeks. The younger the child, the faster ketosidosis happens. Eyes blur vision, especially in um, ketosidosis. You get blurred vision is one of the symptoms. Breath, smell of acetone. Oh, and of course, this is because I'm mostly pediatric, so I'm talking about blurred vision against ketosidosis. But of course, with diabetes type 2, you can have blurred vision because of retinopathy. Um, but small children, retinopathy still a, a bit of years away, it doesn't happen immediately, uh, so their blood vision is usually due to ketosidosis. Breath, uh, smell of acetone, of course that's a sign of ketosidosis, so it's type 1. Systemic weight loss, again, is a feature of type 1. Uh, respiratory syndrome, uh, Kussmaul's breathing and hyperventilation, that's a feature of acidosis, which is of course type 1 for ketosidosis. Gastric, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, not vomiting because of acetone accumulation, so again, it's type 1 it's of acidosis. Abdominal pain is pseudoperitonitis, this is due to acidosis. This is again, ketosidosis, type 1. And the urinary system, polyurea and glucosuria. So we have diabetes type 1, type 2. The third group is called other specific diabetes, there are many of them. Uh, the ones that are most interesting in pediatric medicine include uh, MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young, neonatal diabetes, and a few other uh, congenital disorders which are associated with diabetes. Yeah. This could be uh, various kinds like uh, Klinefelter syndrome, uh, Down syndrome, and other ones. And the fourth one is called gestational diabetes, which is diabetes during pregnancy. Um, 
it's during pregnancy because it starts <laughs> in pregnancy and pretty much ends with childbirth or becomes a different diabetes once the child is born. So it's only gestational when the woman is pregnant. So when she's not pregnant, can say that she's having gestational diabetes. Right? It's mostly concerned with uh, insulin resistance during pregnancy. Um, yes. Uh, hypoglycemia. Idiopathic hypoglycemia. That means we don't know the cause, but it's there. And insulinoma, tumor of the pancreas, which creates hypoproducent insulin, which of course leads to hypoglycemia. Glucogenoma is another possible tumor, which will of course produce glucagon, and uh, that will lead to increased glucose in the blood. And technically, we could also have. Um, Somatostatinoma, which is another tumor of the, which is the third possibility for the pancreas, in which case it will have somatostatin be produced in excess and it will stop all gastric secretions, pancreatic secretions, and as well insulin and glucagon secretion. In the end, this will mean hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. Hyper. Okay, thyroid disorder. So this is another major group uh, of endocrine medicine dealing with the thyroid gland. The possible conditions will include goiter, hyperthyroidism, so increased T4, Graves disease or Graves Bethesda disease, or diffuse toxic goiter. Then we can also have diffu uh, toxic multinodular goiter, mm -hmm. which in fact is actually a um, basically autoimmune thyroiditis at a certain stage. Because it's nodular, so it's Hashimoto's, but it's a different stage. It happens because it's, uh, how can we say it? It's basically a combination of Graves' disease and Hashimoto's. We have both types of antibodies that exist there. Uh, hypothyroidism, usually congenital, but could be secondary or tertiary, congenital or acquired for whatever reason. We can have post resectional hypothyroidism. For instance, the patient has grave disease, we opted for surgical <coughs> removal of the thyroid gland. So we did a subtotal uh, currentectomy. And after it, of course, the patient can have post resectional hypothyroidism because he doesn't have a thyroid gland anymore. But it's also diagnosed. Thyroid cancer, thyroid hormone resistance, the worst one. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. In pediatric medicine, um, the biggest, biggest problem is, of course, congenital hypothyroidism, which leads to significant problems in physical, mental, sexual, and pretty much all development of the child. And uh, it's a significant enough problem that warrants um, mandatory birth screenings of all children. Right. Screening is usually conducted with uh, um, screening is usually conducted by checking the levels of TSH. Usually, in some cases we can go with T4, but usually the screening is using TSH. So, uh, what do we have? We have physiological signs of poor memory and concentration, poor hearing general symptoms of fatigue, feeling cold, weight gain with poor appetite. Hair loss, like we said, the T4 hormone is a trophic hormone. It provides trophic for skin and its appendages. So no trophic hair loss. Pharynx, hoarseness of voice, very typical sign of hypothyroidism. Heart, slow pulse rate, peripheral infusion, uh, the pericardial infusion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a metabolic hormone, so less level of metabolism. Less heart rate, bradycardia, long shortness of breath, bradycnoia, level infusion, muscular delayed reflexes, uh, delayed reflex relaxation, intestine constipation, again because of muscular weakness, ascites, just like we have level infusion, pericardial infusion, you can have ascites, extremities, coldness, carpal tunnel syndrome, reproductive system, menorrhea. Also, what's not, uh, I don't think it's written here, but it should be is uh, weight gain. Oh, yes, it is written here in the general. Weight gain with poor appetite. Oh, one of the most
common sign of this disease if it's severe. In newborn children, if they're born with large body mass, macrosomia, and myxedema. Myxedema. Facial features are coarsened, swollen. The tongue is swollen, sticks out of the mouth. And of course, muscular hypotonia. Uh, here we have a picture also of exophthalmus. Exophthalmus is one of the typical signs of diffuse toxic goiter. <coughs> exophthalmus is the protrusions of the eyeball. Protrusion of the eyeball. Here in this picture we see a person who has what looks like an angry or um, an angry or uh, very concentrated, focused look. Right? Um, what we see here is also the graphosine. The graphosine is the appearance of the white above the iris, and this is, of course, a part of the exothalmus or ophthalmopathy, or also referred to as stereotoxic ophthalmopathy. Pituitary gland disorders. It's another group. Uh, we have posterior pituitary diabetes insipidus, uh, another part of posterior pituitary problem could be inadequate secretion of vasopressin, which means too much vasopressin is secreted, this results in water intoxication syndrome. Anterior pituitary gland, we have hypopituitarism, which is a isolated deficiency of somatotropin. Or we can have plant hypothyroidism, which is a non-isolated deficiency, usually involving deficiency of three or more tropic hormones with different gene mutations. There are different mutated genes that can lead to different variations of plant hypothyroidism. Or we can have pituitary tumor, which usually results in hyperproduction of certain hormones. Pituitary adenoma, proboxinoma, acromegaly gigantism, dwarfism and nanism, and Cushing disease, usually due to hypersecretion of adrenocorticotropic hormones. So we can have Cushing that adrenocorticotropic dependent and adrenocorticotropic independent. Um, some sources opt to not say Cushing as a term, but instead go for uh, adrenocorticotropic dependent hypercorticism and adenocorticotropic independent hypercorticism. Dependence would imply that we have a problem with the anterior pituitary gland, and independence would imply that we have a problem with the actual epinephron. Here are some examples. We have a giant, gigantism, and gigantism usually begins its manifestation as puberty, more common for boys, especially because of testosterone, which helps facilitate further growth. Um, as a being uh, a type of hormone that it is. Um, giants usually come up to the size of about two and a half meters on average, right? and very, very huge full size teeth, requiring custom teeth. Uh, the problem, of course, of giants is the fact that um, it's a tumor, usually, most often, not 100%, of course, but most often it's a tumor, which means that have had it migraine problems in the shell. Also, as it grows, it damages, uh, suppresses, compresses all the other parts of the hypothesis, which means they get pumped hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. in a sense, but uh, a very strange one where you actually have deficiency of all the hormones except some of the problems which you have more of. Mm -hmm. But they will also have hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, right, and hypocorticism. This, of course, leads to uh, muscular weakness. Um, and another thing is that somatotropin has also counterinsular action, also blocks insulin, and so they develop diabetes. This is type three, because it's the specific type. The mm -hmm. specific type in this case is uh, pituitary gland somatotropinoma. Uh, and so there is risk of diabetes as well. Um, their thyroid gland is functioning. Their adrenal glands are not functioning. 
and their sexual development is less. Um, also, somatotropin causes the development of internal organs. They grow asymmetrically. Internal organs develop and become large, and the biggest problem is the heart. As a physiological hypertrophy that happens in the heart if something takes such large size becomes pathological quite quickly. The heart becomes hypertrophic too much, and there's a huge risk of myocardial infarction and ischemia of the myocardium. Furthermore, such huge weight is too much for our vertebra column. As you can see, he's standing with crutches to support himself, because this is too much pressure on the legs and on the vertebra. Scoliosis is very typical for giants. The opposite of this is short stature, or dwarfism, or nanism, or hypopituitarism. This uh, condition manifests at the age of two, three, uh, why not earlier? Well, is the child growing earlier? The answer is no, he's not growing earlier. Uh, but is he born normal? The answer is yes. Most children, of course, are born normal. Why? Because of placental growth factors. They can grow with the child. So unless he has a peripheral type where he has resistance to somatotropin or resistance to the growth factors, and there is a particular condition like that, uh, it's called uh, dwarfism of pygmies when they have uh, resistance, receptoral resistance, receptoral mutation. Uh, he grows normally at birth and then takes time for other children to become taller than this particular baby. And so we can't see the difference until the age 2-3. We just don't notice it. We don't notice the difference. Because the diagnosis is based on anthropometric gigantism and nanism diagnosis are based solely on anthropometric. Well, shouldn't it be based on the hormone? The answer is no, because we can have different types of nanism. This is just one type of nanism that's called pituitary. But we can have, for instance, nanism due to extreme deficiency of T4, which can still result in nanism. Not always, but can. In which case, we would have uh, non pituitary mm -hmm. But the question of diagnosis of nanism depends solely on anthropometry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with pituitary nanism, work in the child is short stature, but proportional. His internal organs are proportionally small, his arms and legs are proportional, but his face remains like a baby's face. Sometimes it's called a doll's face or puppet face. Mm -hmm. The eyes are small, the lips are small, the nose is small, the ears are small, as opposed to giants, which develop acromegaly. They will have large ears, large nose, large brows, large mouth, large lips, large hands, large feet, and big shoe sizes. Okay. Sex hormone disorders. Children with precocious puberty begin to menstruate and develop breasts before they turn eight years old, in the case of girls. <laughs> and grow rapidly and see their voices deepen before nine in the case of boys. What is precocious puberty? It's puberty before its time. It's preterm puberty. Not to be confused with early puberty. Early puberty occurs after nine, uh, after, um, well, from the age of nine for girls and from the age of 10, 11 for boys. It's just that they develop faster than normal. By the age of nine, uh, by the age of ten, the girl is developed like she's thirteen. This would be early puberty, but not precaution. <coughs> precaution is puberty before its time. And delayed puberty uh, would have a slow progression on the tenor scale. Tenor scale uh, uses various kinds of secondary sex characteristics to define the development. So if um, certain sex characteristics don't develop in the specific time frame, usually um, 13 for girls and 15 for girls and 14 for boys. So the main three characteristics, I will show you them in the next slide and we'll discuss how they work in terms of age. So what do we have? We have disorders of sex development or internal disorders. 
Uh, or I'm sorry, inter sex development or intersex disorders. Uh, her hermaphroditism is a term that currently being um, not used much, instead opting for simply intersex. Um, gonadal dysgenesis and androgen ins insensitivity syndrome. So gonadal dysgenesis, we can have problems with gonads. They're not working. We can have primary and secondary gonadal problems, which can be referred to as hypergonadotropic hypogonadisms or hypogonadotropic hypogonadisms. Uh, and we can have um, various kinds of gonadal problems due to direct damage of the gonad for various congenital or non-congenital reasons. Disorders of puberty, again, delayed and precocious puberty, um, and early sexual development. And menstrual functions or fertility disorders, amenorrhea or polycystic ovary syndrome, which does give some very interesting clinical um, signs. Sex hormonal disorders, we have Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is characterized as a genetic dis disease, a monosomia of the X chromosome, giving a karyotype of the patient as 45X0, XO. The defining characteristics are short stature, low hairline, shield-shaped thorax, widely spaced nipples, shortened metacarpals, or small fingernails, brown spots on nevi, no menstruation because of completely completely undeveloped uterus. Uh, rudimentary ovaries and gonadal streaks, underdeveloped gonadal structures, elbow deformity, poor blood development, cortation of the aorta, sometimes the aorta stenosis, neck folds or wings on the neck, and characteristic facial features um, of various signs of this embryogenesis. Hypogonadism, gonadotropin deficiency, uh, we can have inherited, uh, inherited or acquired, and we can have deficiency of gonadotropin, <coughs> deficiency of gonadoliberin, or we can have deficiencies of the final hormone, the testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Inherited genetic and chromosomal disorders include the Kalman syndrome, which we previously explained, the Turner syndrome, which is shown here, Klein Tesler syndrome, which will be shown next. Acquired disorders such as ovarian failure or premature menopause and testicular failure. Here we see Klein Tesler syndrome and its typical manifestations. Now, Turner syndrome was a phenotypical female. So, although the karyotype is 45X0, the phenotype is female. Underdeveloped, we have hypogonadism. But it's female. For crime culture, the phenotype is male. The phenotype is male. We have female characteristics. So, in a sense, Klein culture could be described as intersex, but it's definitely not hermaphroditism. Mm -hmm. Not in any sense. Because lone breast development cannot signify to hermaphroditism. We still have testes, and we still have uh, external genitalia that are male. This is not a hemoprodite. So, <coughs> the term intersex should be used loosely for this one. They're not actually intersex, but kind of, right? As far as Turner syndrome, they're definitely not intersex, they're female. There's no question of that again. They have both. Uh, internal and external genitalia as female, they're underdeveloped, but they're still there. So true intersex is when we have both. And we can have uh, both as true hermaphroditism, where both uh, female and male genitalia exist at the same time, or we can have both, where internal organs are female, external or male, or the opposite. Internal or male, external or female. For example, false hemophroditism could be as a sign of chronic congenital epinephral insufficiency. 
due to deficiency of 21 hydroxylate enzymes that you saw in the story the genesis. It leads to the absence of cortisol and often under uh, aldosterone, but the hyperproduction of testosterone, which causes an effect called virilization, the transformation of female external genitalia into males inside the uterus. So the child who is karyotypically 46XX is born with internal female uterus, ovaries, and external male genitalia. The opposite effect would be the syndrome which is previously was called testicular feminization. Right now they renamed that one as well. The point is we have a male whose testes are not working. Uh, mostly due to the fact of deficiency of follicular stimulating hormone. They're not descending, so they get stuck uh, inside the abdomen. They don't descend, they're compressed, they're damaged, and the child's external genitalia develops as female. While the child does not have uterus, does not have ovaries, but does have testes inside the abdomen or in the inguinal canal. So the external genitalia are female. In which case, these are truly intersex. Mm -hmm. Not fine test. Fine tells are frontal boldness, uh, absent, poor beard growth, narrow shoulders, white hips, tendency to grow fewer chest hairs, breast development, female type, pubic hair pattern, small testicular size. So one of the main uh, signs of development for boys is the increase in testicular size. White hips, long arms and legs. Mm -hmm. Here is the tenor scale presented. And this is the shortened version of the tenor scale, that doesn't expect this version of course. This is the short one, we have breast development, which is referred to as telarchy. The term telarchy, breast development, and adrenarchy, hair growth. Mm -hmm. If telarchy and adrenarchy is absent by the age of 13 in girls, this is considered delayed sexual development. If adrenarchy, the hair growth, is absent in boys, by the age of 14, and testicular size remains prepubescent by the age of 14, this is delayed sexual development. One more term is menarche, first menstruation. If menarche did not occur in girls by the age of 15, this is considered to be delayed sexual development. One more slide for calcium homeostasis disorders and metabolic bone disease. Uh, we have parathyroid gland disorders, primary, secondary, tertiary, hypoparathyroidism, and pseudohypoparathyroidism. Osteoporosis is the result, Osteo, osteo uh, osteitis deformans is the result of this problem. Recap, we can have various kinds of recap, not just the vitamin D um, childhood recap, and osteomalacia can also be a sign because the, even the childhood recap works through the parathyroid gland. Mm -hmm. Deficiency of vitamin D leads to deficiency of calcium, which causes parathyroid hyperfunction, and washing away of calcium from bones, leading to osteomalacia, osteoporosis. So here are some of the mechanisms by which this works, and we develop these pieces that we develop. And that is all. Thank you for your attention.